Hi, this is Mahabali from the American University in Cairo, and today I have with me Jasmina. Go ahead, Jasmina. Hi, I'm Jasmina Najjar. I teach academic writing and technical communication at the American University of Beirut. Go ahead, Jasmina. You have a really fun um, activity. Yeah. So today we are going to be um, looking at an activity called uh, collaborative storytelling. So um, let's just jump in. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to share my screen so that you can all uh, follow along. So here we go. Amazing. So um, in this activity, the, uh, the purpose behind it of collaborative storytelling is really to kind of like, you know, um, help break the ice in class. It really also helps to promote a kind of like sense of community and it can be really super fun. And, you know, honestly, like as a teacher, I love reading these stories and I really get a kick out of them. Um, and it's really useful um, in that, you know, you can use it really at any point of the semester. What I usually do is I have it as an ongoing activity throughout the semester. So I tell students at the beginning, hey, this is, you know, um, we're going to be doing this together. And then, you know, I basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, let them take it from there. Um, and it's really, I think, a very fun way of also, you know, just encouraging students to pay attention to like little details to kind of get into the habit of close reading as well. And thinking about logical, you know, uh, possible scenarios that can result um, based on, you know, a set of actions and dialogues and what have you. And it also, I mean, like as somebody who teaches writing, it's a very nice way as well of kind of, you know, uh, getting students to try to follow a kind of unified style and voice. Um, you know, and it's just fun. It's an opportunity for them to, you know, unleash their creativity and go mad. And I like that. So um, to prepare for this, it's actually quite easy. You just need to set up a kind of shared editable uh, Google Doc or, you know, any editable document or set up a wiki within your uh, LMS. Um, they're available on any platform, regardless of whether you're using Moodle or anything else. And then you need to kind of just have a think about, you know, what you want, um, you know, whether you want your students to collectively as a class decide on the basic kind of prompt or plot that they're going to use as a springboard for the story or whether you're going to use one of the kind of like random online uh, plot generators. There are many that are available uh, online. Um, another alternative is to kind of, you know, come up with a very basic, uh, uh, you know, story plot, which is relevant to the class. So maybe, you know, if it's a science class, it could be a, just a simple framing of a scientist working at a research lab and then letting the students, you know, take it from there. Or an entrepreneur, you know, setting up her own business, if it's a, you know, a business class, for example. I can totally see this as a way for students to like write up scenarios for case studies, you know, discipline or Indeed. ethical dilemmas or things like that. Mm -hmm. So if you're Indeed. not teaching writing, but you're teaching one of those other things, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or even, you know, you're teaching anthropology, it could be about an anthropologist, you know, conducting particular field research, you know, so you can really bring it in, uh, you know, to different, I think, class contexts. And that's what, what's fun about this uh, particular, you know, collaborative storytelling exercise. How many, how many people per group? Do you have like pairs? Do you have the entire class? I have the entire class because mm. I like, how I many like do you have? the messiness. So I've got to 25 students per class. Wow, yeah. So it just gets very interesting. It gets really interesting. So um, that's a, this is why when you have like 25 people jumping in, um, you know, it's really important, you know, post preparation to kind of make it clear what the ground rules are and to kind of make it clear what it is that, you know, is expected of students. Um, for example, you need to decide, you know, 
um, how many times per semester do you want the students to contribute to the story? For example, do you want each student to contribute three times throughout the semester if you're doing it on a semester level? And how much content you'd like them to contribute each time? Do you want them to contribute just a line? Do you want them to contribute a whole paragraph? Do you want them to contribute a whole page, depending on obviously the nature of the assignment and how many students you have? And then it's important to also have kind of ground rules for the students. For example, please don't delete or edit your what your classmates added. You know, just you know, out of etiquette. You know, and you know. Um, and also, um, you know, make sure that they understand that they have to read what was written so far rather carefully. Um, make the point that, you know, they have total freedom to create the kind of twists and turns that they want and to move the story forward, you know, the way that they'd like to. But whatever they add really has to make sense and seem logical given what has come, you know, before, given what other students have written beforehand. And that means obviously being true to the style, the genre, the plot, the characters, and you know, uh, and what have you. Now, this is actually an asynchronous activity. And, you know, as I mentioned, I mean, it's really up to you how, as to the duration, you know, do you want to run it just for a week ahead of a particular assignment? Do you want to have it throughout the semester? That's completely up to you. Um, you could, I suppose, if you wanted, you know, try to like jump in and have it in a class session live, but that can, I think, get really, really messy. So I would, I personally wouldn't try, but I mean, go for it if you're brave enough. Um, now, obviously, you can use any, you know, online, you know, editable document sharing kind of platform you know, that en enables multiple people to work on the same document. And also you can do this if you don't want to have it in text format. You know, you can have it using video, audio, visuals, you know, what have you. Um, as long as, you know, you, you kind of, but in that case, you might need to figure out the order, you know, so that, you know, students are not, you know, you, they're not going off on like bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, you could possibly do it on Twitter using a hashtag. Um, I haven't tried this, but it, it could work. You could also use Twine, for example, if you want to have an interactive, nonlinear, uh, you know, story. But then again, can more than one person edit Twine at the same time? You might need to create like one account and then give students turns. Uh, right. Okay. No, and so they also they can pass it on to someone pass it on to someone. And then again, with that, I mean, you would need students to learn various other skills right. and how to use the platform. Right. So. Right. so you need to check if that actually makes sense for your uh, course goals, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, if you want to do something, you know, uh, improv, you can do it in a class session yeah. on Zoom. Can I, kind of, can I try one of those improvs with you? If you want, yeah. Yeah, because um, this I saw in a workshop about, the, about you know, film and theater improv. Mm -hmm. And so this is for doing it orally on Zoom, but I think you can totally do it in text synchronously or asynchronously. And, mm -hmm. and this can be just like a warm-up activity in the beginning of the class where not every single person participates, but maybe every class, like five or six people participate and the others are watching. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of like every person needs to start their sentence. They just have to say one sentence and they have to start their sentence with the next letter of the alphabet. So you set the scene with a particular uh, situation, like, yes, you're in the science lab. And then I'm mm -hmm. gonna start and I say something with an A and then you have to say something with a B and then I have to say something with a C. Mm -hmm. So let's just do it up to D or something. So, All right. Okay. Are you doing the heating experiment, Josemina? Boring. Why would I be doing the eating experiment? Instead, <laughs> I am planning to go to CERN and to investigate what's been happening at the Large Hadron Collider. CERN, wow. Can you take me with you? Definitely. And I think it's going to be a fabulous experience. Because... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Well, and this is really fun to do with kids too, because I do it with my child sometimes just when we're bored in the car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think this one could work for K to 12 as well. The, uh, another, That's true. 
And yeah. then actually a recommendation, don't do this. We're, do, we're both filming this early in the morning. Do it yeah. once people have woken up. Uh-huh, right. So they could, it's actually funny because you can say really silly things. So I think part of it, and one of the things that they say with improv is it's okay to be silly. It's okay. Don't focus mm -hmm. on looking good. Just focus on giving the other person um, something to talk, to say, like don't close the story. Um, another one was just you limit how many words in a sentence that each person can contribute. And that's really mm -hmm. useful, especially like you teach writing. And we were talking recently about, you know, limiting your word count to things like that. It's like learning mm -hmm. how to say what you want in only three words or only six words um, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Another one, by the way, because you said they need to stick to genre. I saw one where each person is doing a different genre. But mm -hmm. the story has to flow. But someone's writing like <laughs> a thriller and someone else is writing like a fantasy novel and someone else is writing a romance novel. But the story still has to flow. So that it has to flow. I mean, like, yeah, I've had that. I've had like a class, you know, it started off like a murder mystery and then it became a really cheesy romance. <laughs> and then, you know, suddenly it became this like doom and gloom dystopian. I don't know what. And then, it, you know. And I mean, it's completely fine. I think really, I mean, this is what I like about this. It's just super flexible and, um, and you can really mold it to suit your class, to suit, you know, what kind of goals you have. So it works actually quite well. So, so one of the things, obviously, if, if you're teaching a writing class um, and you're going to let them do collaborative writing later, this is such a great, like, sort of warm up to collaborative writing as a whole, as well as building community. And you were telling me that, aside from the collaborative storytelling, you let them do collaborative literature reviews, right? Indeed. So now we're going to move on to our second little exercise of the day, which is a collaborative literature review matrix. Now, I know to most people, if you tell them it's a literature review matrix, they're like, oh, yeah. But, you know, literature review matrixes can be really sexy, I think. So, <laughs> um, I think really, you know, the, this particular activity, you know, what's um, cool about it is it really helps to create a discourse community in class. Because we always talk about, you know, the way in academic writing, it's important to have a discourse community, but the discourse community is always this distant entity in space, you know? So this is actually a nice opportunity to kind of, you know, bring it in and to give the, you know, students an opportunity to feel what it's like to be in the discourse of community of a particular discipline. So, um, and, you know, it's really useful kind of like as a preparation exercise ahead of maybe a class discussion where you, you're covering a particular topic and you've assigned maybe three or four articles, you know, you have several readings. Um, it's good preparation ahead of a class discussion about a particular topic where you want students to actually go off find their own maybe peer-reviewed journal articles or their own, uh, you know, sources from, you know, popular uh, publications and to come and, you know, uh, bring that into the class discussion in addition to what you have in the textbook, for example. Um, it's also uh, good to do um, as preparation when you want students to write a literature review that's part of or maybe a research proposal or a research paper uh, for the class. And it really, I mean, it not only sharpens close reading and research and summarizing and paraphrasing and, you know, citation uh, skills as well. Um, but it, I think it encourages kind of, uh, you know, um, you know, content mastery and also knowledge sharing, which I think is uh, important. So it's actually pretty simple uh, to set up again. You just need a shared editable Google Doc or whatever shared, you know, editable document uh, platform you like to use or a wiki within your, uh, you know, um, LMS. And you just need to add a very basic literature review matrix table. And, you know, you can have as many sources as you want. You can have, you know, as many, you know, main ideas um, as you want. And what uh, Maha and I are going to do now is we're going to kind of show you what happens. 
So we edit um, this part. Hmm? Can edit, edit this? Part? The one, yeah, the one in front of us now. So Maha and I are gonna get busy. Sure, you're wondering what are we doing? The suspense. All right. We're not going to fill it all out. Don't worry. We're not here to bore you people to death. <laughs> We're just going to show you how it works. So as you can see, we're just adding This is obviously a paper related to customer loyalty in e-commerce, uh, you know, uh, an online context. And it's also about, you know, the impact and influence of stakeholders in the digital age. We're adding- So obviously we don't type that far. No, we don't. We, we have been, we are prepared we are nerdy. We've done our research in the background. And so then for each of the topics, uh, we're, we're, we've, we've got this written somewhere else, copied and pasted. So for, for each of the sources under each of the arguments, we're putting in our quotes or our paraphrases, right? Paraphrases and what we're doing here, let's do that now. We've added our sources. And as you can see, we, we used Harvard style uh, citation. And it's a good way of, again, letting students practice citation. And now what we're going to do, we're going to add, uh, I'll add something uh, to customer loyalty. So will Maha. Let's do that now. So what I did, I added a paraphrase and I have the citation add. which needs a bit of fixing. Maha is gonna add hers now. So Maha added a quotation All right, now we're going to move on to the next point, the next source, set of sources. How do you divide the work between students? Is each student responsible for an argument or responsible for a source or? Again, that depends. Remember, I talked about the variations. So it depends on how you decide to do that. If you are giving students free reign to find their own source and then bring it in, then yeah, they will, you know, each one would have one source, they come, they bring it in. If let's say, and they add whatever relevant points are related to that particular one source that they have. Um, if let's say you have students who are, you know, you've told them these are the three articles that we're gonna be reading ahead of our class discussion. Um, and I want each student to add, um, you know, I don't know, three main points uh, from that particular article, you know, from each article that has been read, or maybe one point from each article. Um, it's really up to you to decide how you're going to divide up the work. But obviously, you need to make it clear to students if something has been said, do not restate it. <laughs> and that they need to add, obviously, something new. Okay. Is that a bit clearer? Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, I guess there's so many different ways you could. Uh, you can do this. On what's important, like in some classes, each student's bringing their own source, and so they could be reading different things. But if the content Indeed. is actually relevant to your course, and all of them have to read them anyway, then it's about each one being responsible for taking certain steps. Yeah. So maybe, for example, you know, um, I've got my students. Um, let's go down to stakeholders now. We're adding. I'm a good student. I already finished. You finished. Okay. So I finished now as well. So um, you can even, I mean, what I like to do as well, I like to keep the main ideas 
I mean, it's up to you. For the main ideas, as a you know, as an instructor, or you know, uh, you know, you can, you know, pinpoint the main ideas that you want, and you can fill them in yourself uh, to kind of guide the class discussion or the literature review that will be used in, say, a research paper, or you can leave it completely open and see what main ideas, you know, the students can come up with based on, let's say, the three articles that you've given them to read. Yeah. It feels, like it, would depend, it feels like it would depend on um, how mature your students are and how much scaffolding they need, maybe the first time you give it to them and then the next time. This is one of the things about uh, rhetoric and composition and freshman writing type courses, um, is that if you scaffold too much, when they get into the disciplines, nobody's scaffolding that for them. So it kind of makes sense to scaffold for them if they don't know how to do it. And then the next step, let them start, start to do it on their own now that they've seen how it's done, just to help them make that transfer. It seems obvious to us, but not always to students. Like, oh, if someone doesn't do that for me, do I still have to do it? <laughs> I'm kind of like, no, it's a very good point. In fact, I mean, I think this is, it would be good maybe like early on in the semester to do this, let's say, um, you know, just ahead of a class discussion, make it a little bit, you know, less, you know, formal, um, you know, give students the three articles maybe, and then have the main ideas that you have set as, you know, as the, the teacher. And then, you know, once they've done the literature review, even have a discussion, let's say, you know, if you were to do this, what main ideas would you have put is there anything you would have changed? You know, it's a very, I think it's a good add on. And then, you know, ahead of maybe their research proposal, you know, um, you know, let them come up with the main ideas. So I think, you know, you can definitely build on that. I love that. Is there anything you want to add? So uh, for this particular, um, you know, um, um, you know, exercise it's just a matter of you know making sure what is expected of students on their end as a contribution we kind of already discussed that and again i mean this is an asynchronous activity because they need to go off and do their research i mean you know so um you know it can ultimately run for as long as you need if you want to have it maybe just give students 48 hours to do it, you want students mm -hmm. to have a week to do it, it's really up to you. You can potentially, if students have all done the same readings, do it on a, you know, collaboratively on a Google Doc in class. But again, I like students to have like the time to think. Yes, exactly. And not have a gun to their head. <laughs> you know, like do this now, right? So, um, so that's it. <laughs> I can also see like if students have done something like hypothesis annotations on articles ahead of time, then it would be much easier to do it synchronously if you wanted. So they would do the thinking time by annotating the article. Um, and then during class time, they're just putting it into, into this table to sort of help them see how they can then use their hypothesis annotations, which we talked about in another video, help them use these in the literature review. And that will show them how quickly they can do it. So that could be. Okay, thank you so much, Jasmina. Just give us your final word before we uh, turn off recording. So um, I just want to tell everyone, you know, stay safe and, and good luck creating, uh, you know, a nice sense of community in your classes. Thank you so much, Jasmina, for those wonderful ideas.